I want to tell you all a little story that symbolizes uh, why I stayed involved in the pro-life movement because I'm sure everybody can agree it's kind of a, a kind of a weird job to have. Um, nobody says at career day in high school that they want to work full time in the pro-life movement. And so how we end up here and then what keeps us here of course, everybody has their own story, but I find that uh, most people's story have one thing in common. And that's that in some way or another, they have actually come face to face with the reality of what abortion actually is. And for me, uh, that first experience uh, was when I went to university and I grew up in a pro-life home. I would have considered myself pro-life, but I really had no idea what that meant. And it was actually seeing a video of an abortion uh, during my lunch hour in the library of the University of the Fraser Valley that brought me face to face with the victims of Canada's abortion industry and helped me truly realize for the very first time what was actually going on. That abortion wasn't just another thing on a list of Christian issues that I was supposed to care about. Abortion was a real injustice with real victims and the, those victims, their invisibility had made even people like me who called myself pro-life detached from that issue in a way that I could not after I saw that video. And I know that a lot of you have been working in the movement for many years, so you'll recognize uh, what I'm about to say next is one of the reasons it's so hard to get people involved in this movement is because many of the churches will say, well, this is a political issue, we can't deal with it. And the politicians will say, that's a religious issue, we can't legislate morality. And the corpses pile up in between, while everybody has excuses that prevent them from getting involved. And before I explain the hope for the pro-life movement, I want to address uh, that conception just for a moment, because it came to me very powerfully in 2014, just a couple of years after I started my full-time work with CCBR. And I was uh, speaking at a conference in California, it was an international pro-life youth conference, and I was giving a speech on how principles of past social reform movements can be applied to uh, the abortion debate today, talking about making those victims visible and making people aware of what was truly going on. And at the end of that presentation, an older guy came up to me and said, I've, I've got something that I want you to see. You've just been in the movement for a couple of years, um, you guys have some good ideas, but I think there's something missing, something that you need to be fully aware of. And I said, okay, no, I'd, I'd love to see what you want to show me. And he said, well, let's get in my truck and, and go to my house. And I was like, okay, well, that's, that's, that's fine, but um, I wasn't that worried. And so we went to his place, and on the way there, he talked about something uh, that the pro-life movement, especially in the United States, has done uh, for many years. He was one of those who would go through dumpsters behind abortion clinics, would take the victims of abortion out of the dumpster to give them a real burial. And I don't know why it didn't click as he was telling me this. Uh, I read Monica Miller's book where she describes doing just that, so I was aware that pro-lifers had done this. But I got to his place and we went to the, the garage with him and he, he went over to a shelf and he handed me something. And it took almost a full minute for, for me to register what it really is. It was a jar about this big, and inside was a tiny little boy. That picture was taken with my cell phone. He pulled it out of the dumpster of an abortion clinic, and I s stood there and I, I kind of stared at, I stared at this. It's, it's a bad picture because it's with my cell phone, but this little boy, his skin was pure white. It looked like there was nothing wrong with him. And so in, when I moved the jar, I could feel him bumping against the edges of the jar. And for, for some reason, very stupidly, I almost expected him to wake up, and I turned it around in my hands looking for why he wasn't. And then I saw two puncture wounds in the back of his skull. And that was where the abortionist had killed him. And I was, I was in shock, as you can imagine, because I'd seen many videos of abortion victims. I'd seen many pictures of abortion victims, but I'd never come face to face with one of the actual victims. And I remember thinking to myself, there are so many just like him. And why does nobody care? And I remember thinking over and over in my head, and I'm sure many of you in your years in the movement have heard the same criticism. People who say to you, why do you care about the real orphans? 
Right? Why don't you care about the foster kids? Why don't you care about those who really need your help? Why don't you help real children? And when I put the jar down on the table, I saw a label on the lid. And there was only two things on the label. It was the name of the abortionist who had killed him and the place where, where he'd been killed. And I remember thinking to myself, is there anybody more orphaned than this? We don't know who his mother was, who his father was. We don't know what his last name was. We, we don't know anything about him. The only two things we know about this little boy, obviously a little boy, is where he was killed and who killed him. Is there anybody in our society today more orphaned than those who have been cut off so thoroughly from their natural family and from the human family? That's been abandoned so completely that the only things we know about these babies are who killed them. They are the real orphans of our society. And they are more thoroughly orphaned than anybody else. And nobody speaks for them. But they're there. In this country, 300 of them every day. I went to a funeral service for some aborted babies once near Michigan. And I saw a gravestone near where the ceremony was being held. And the gravestone just said, Hoderi's babies. Hoderi, again, was the name of the abortionist who killed those babies. We know nothing else about these little girls and these little boys. We know nothing about them except for the name of the man who killed them. And so, especially for those of you who have spent so many years fighting in the pro-life movement, I think sometimes it's good to remember that these are the real orphans. And that the reason we have to keep going and the reason we have to push forward is because most people don't recognize them as orphans and most people don't care. And that's why it's so, so important for all of you to continue doing the work that you do. And now, moving on from that experience, which was very formative for me. I was already working in the pro-life movement full time, but I think the moment I picked up that little boy was the moment I knew I was never going to leave until abortion in Canada was ended. But I want to give you a few reasons why I think that that is not an impossibility. And again, I know so many of you have spent so many years in the pro-life movement and there have been so many discouragements, but there's also a lot of reason for hope. And I just want to give you four reasons. They only gave me 45 minutes. I could probably keep you here for a lot longer. But the first reason that's important for people to remember, because people don't like history very much anymore, is that history is actually on our side. 2019 is going to be the anniversary of 50 years of legal abortion in this country. It will mark the passing of more than 4 million pre-born children. But we often forget when we look at those 50 years, that we are not the first movement to confront an injustice that is deeply entrenched in the culture of our day. And we won't be the last. We look at 50 years, and I'm sure many of you have heard this so many times from your friends or family members or people you hang out with. I love your work, but this is never going away. There's no chance that we are ever going to definitively beat the abortion industry. And we know that child sacrifice is as old as time, so in some ways they're right. But we have examples from history that we can point to that give us a lot more hope. And I'll, I'll just give you a couple. I think the most powerful example would be the very first social reform movement that sought to change public opinion on a grassroots level. And it would be the man on the far left, William Wilberforce. He was actually converted to Christianity under the preaching of Reverend John Newton, who was a former slave trader. Most of you will recognize him as the man who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. And he was going to leave politics because he thought it was a dirty business. He wanted to leave politics because he felt it made him a worse person. He wanted to go somewhere and serve God. And it was meetings with John Newton that convinced him in 1787 to sit down with 13 people in a little bookshop in London and commit to spending the rest of his life fighting something that nobody thought could be beaten. And that was the international slave trade. In 2019, abortion will have been legal in Canada for 50 years. In 1787, the international slave trade had been legal in one form or another for all of human history. They didn't have a blueprint for how to fight slavery because it had always been part of human existence, something that was so unquestionable, something that was so part of the fabric of society that even those who agreed with Wilberforce's aims, like the great philosopher Edmund Burke, thought there was no way it could be done. 
But yet, he stood up, he spoke, and people came to listen. And then they took pictures, and they took evidence of what was taking place. They spread it across the country. Little groups began to pop up across the nation, and in 1807, the Slave Trade Act passed. 20 years it took, but only 20 years when you consider the fact that the slave trade had always been legal. I could give you hundreds of examples of men just like Wilberforce. Many people think the pro-life movement started you know, maybe around 1973 when abortion was first legalized in the United States, or 1969 when it was first decriminalized in Canada, but it actually started 2,000 years ago when a small group of Christians exploded out of the synod of Jerusalem and began to transform the societies of their day. Societies that were so steeped in abortion and infanticide that even the story of the founding of Rome is the story of two children who were abandoned by their mother and raised by wolves. Abortion and infanticide were so common that the heart shape that most of us use on Valentine's Day is actually the shape of a plant called sylvium. Nobody knows about this much anymore because it went extinct. It was used as an abortifacient. And it was harvested to extinction by people who wanted to use this plant to induce miscarriages. The last known plants were given to Emperor Nero as a gift, and they were at that point worth their weight in gold. There's nothing new under the sun. Infanticide and abortion have always existed, but infanticide and abortion have been beaten time and time again. And in fact, Basil of Caesarea, about 300 years after those first Christians started defying cultural norms, saving babies, caring for pregnant temple prostitutes that nobody else cared about, putting an end to abortion rings, the first pro-life laws were passed. And it was a crime in the Roman Empire to commit infanticide and to commit abortion the first pro-life laws. I could give you, again, hundreds of examples, but I think one of the reasons history is so important is not just because it's full of cool stories, because suddenly we'll realize that we walk in the footsteps of giants who cast a long shadow, and if we turn around, we can realize that what we're facing is nothing they didn't face too. And that with God's help, time and time again, cultures of death have sprung out, our cultures of life have sprung out of cultures of death. This has been done before. There's nothing we face today that they didn't face too. And when we derive strength from their example, and when we base some of our tactics and our strategies on what worked for them, I think that we can derive a lot of hope by those in the past. The second reason is one that all of you are very familiar with, but I don't think this can be emphasized enough. The arguments are on our side. And this is something that uh, pro-choice people that we at CCBR converse with are consistently shocked to find out. <laughs> because most of them haven't come up with anything more innovative than my body or my choice, um, or you know, signs like 77% uh, of uh, pro-life leaders are men and 0% of them can get pregnant. Um, none of those numbers actually phase up to reality, but this is the best they've got. Um, and what we find talking to hundreds upon hundreds of people and CCBR has, in the last five years, facilitated thousands of face-to-face -face conversations right across the country from campuses to high schools to city streets. And over and over and over again, we see the realization dawn on people that nothing they've been told is true. And that, in fact, science, embryology, these things are on the pro-life side, not on the pro-choice side. We use very, very simple arguments. Human beings have human rights. Human rights begin when the human being begins. Science tells us when the human being begins. Therefore, abortion is a human rights violation. Pro-lifers aren't asking anybody to legislate morality. We're simply asking for science-based public policy like everybody else does. And this is something we have seen work time and time again. There's something that's important to remember about this generation, too. Is it 30, 40 years ago, there was a cultural battle for the hearts and minds of Canadians on the abortion issue, and the pro-choice movement did an incredible job of framing this as a matter of choice rather than what was being chosen, which was the decapitation, dismemberment, and disemboweled of a living human child. But when we focus the debate back on what it is that is being chosen, we are facing a generation who has not come to their conclusions intellectually. This is just their birthright. The pro-choice worldview is something they grew up hearing. They've never doubted it. And we get to face them with the compelling evidence drawn from embryology textbooks, it radically transforms their view. I personally have seen hundreds upon hundreds of people change their mind. 
And that is something that is incredible to witness. One of the reasons so many young people come and work for CCBR is because they realize that with a very simple set of arguments that are not very difficult to wield in debate, they can actually watch the minds of their peers transformed on this issue, and as a result, they can see lives saved. This is something I think that should give all of you encouragement. Somebody asked me once how I can deal with so many depressing topics and not get depressed. And the reason for that is really, really simple. Not every day is awesome. But I know every day at the end of the day, when I go home, that this country is a little bit more pro-life than when I woke up. Because we've got people right across the country. Which brings me to my third point. And that's that the momentum is on our side. And this is often difficult to discern, but if we take a look at what's going on here in North America, there are several important things to notice. Uh, first of all, is the fact that the pro-life movement has been gaining steam, not losing steam. In a cultural atmosphere where we seem to have lost a lot of debates, when we seem to have lost the debate on marriage, when we seem to have lost the debate about Christian principles in the public square, the one place we consistently gain rather than lose ground is winning hearts and minds on the abortion issue. One of the reasons for that, of course, is because we can frame these arguments in terms of science and human rights in ways that everybody can understand. But further to that, one of the things, how many of you have ever seen a sign at pro-choice counter-protest that says, I can't believe I still have to protest this stuff? That's because they actually can't believe they still have to protest this stuff. <laughs> and they can't figure out why everybody who's protesting for life is like 30 years younger than they are. And this is something that they haven't quite wrapped their head around yet. Why, for example, uh, the March for Life continues to grow, especially in the U.S. just in recent years. Um, some of you will recognize the name Nancy Keenan of NARAL Pro-Choice America. Well, she actually quit her job when she happened to be in D.C. on the train at the same time as the American March for Life. She said, there's so many of them and they're so young. And she finally came to the realization that it's very difficult to build a youth movement based on killing off young people. If the time comes for the second generation to show up and defend her values, it turns out that they're not there. And that's something I think that we, we should draw a lot of strength from as well. Also just look, in the last 10 years in Canada, the number of new pro-life groups that have come out, people who have dedicated their lives to fighting abortion. I always think of my friend Mike Shoot from We Need a Law. He was running a greenhouse operation. Now he's talking to MPs about abortion. I think of Alyssa Globe and Scott Hayward from right now. The level of sacrifice that younger people are willing to take to spend day in, day out, advocating for laws on abortion and advocating for the lives of preborn children is, I think, something you can all draw encouragement from. We don't throw away our careers lightly. So when we decide to commit to something full time, it's because we've seen results and we know it can be done. I have, yes, held a dead baby in a jar. I've also gone to hold in my arms a pre-born baby who was scheduled to be aborted at the Kensington Clinic in Calgary, but whose mother changed her mind after walking past one of our displays. And the truth is extremely powerful. Sometimes we forget how powerful the truth is because there's so much opposition, and that opposition is so vocal, and that's because they're getting increasingly desperate. If you look at books that have come out recently in Canada from university presses, and I know nobody reads those, um, <laughs> but there's a few of them that address abortion, and I've picked up copies of them to see what they have to say about the pro-life movement now. One of them came out from the University of Ottawa. It was called The Changing Face or Changing Voice of the Anti-Abortion Movement. And in that book, they describe how much more effective the Canadian pro-life movement has become, and then they try to lay out a strategy for combating that. The only reason they struggle to do that is because the only national group in the country who advocates for abortion rights is Joyce Arthur of the Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada, and she's not adding on staff. She just actually went down to a part-time volunteer position. Right. The entire abortion rights movement right now is one person in a French office in Vancouver. And look how many people are in this room. Their movement is small. They don't have anything on their side right now except consensus. And those of you who have been in this movement for a long time know how hard it is to defend consensus. Well, it's their turn now, and it's our turn now. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can keep this momentum going just based on what we've seen in the last decade, last 15 years.
things have become. Well, basically, as I said to one reporter from a magazine in Quebec, she didn't like it very much, um, but she said, so where's the pro-choice response to what you guys are doing? I'm like, oh, they won in the late 90s, packed up and went home. <laughs> so they left the battlefield to us, and here we are. Um, but we have some things to say if you'd like to ask further questions. And this is something that we've seen happen time and time and time again. Finally, I want to reiterate the obvious, and that's that the youth is on our side, as I mentioned before. Woo! <laughs> and they're one of the best. This is something that we've seen explode in recent years. And when that uh, bubble zone law cropped up in Ontario a couple of weeks ago, one of the things that stunned me the most is this law was put forward on the premise uh, that abortion clinics are, you know, hot spots of protest and that, you know, people are facing violence every single day. And we know that's ridiculous. One of the easy ways we can determine that is the fact that the only example the Attorney General could bring up was a single instance of somebody allegedly being spat on. Uh, there are plenty of avenues to deal with that. You don't need a wide sweep of law. The reality is that uh, progressive politicians are increasingly trying to distract from their failing economic records by picking a fight with the Christians again. It worked for 30 years and they're figuring why not try it now. But we can't be distracted by this because I, wanted, I wrote an article after that took place about where the real violence actually is. And at CCBR, the level of violence that we often have to deal with on the streets is through the roof. We had a young man, he's 18 years old, and we were out doing choice chain with our signs. Uh, this is, I think, in, yeah, this was in July. And some guy actually walked past him and grabbed him by the throat. And we went to talk to him afterwards to, you know, make sure he was all calm and he was fine. And, and then we said, yeah, okay, how are you doing, Will? And he said, you know what? If I can experience some small fraction of the pain preborn children go while I'm defending them, then that's worth it. We see over and over and over again. <laughs> Young people who are willing to get spat on, willing to get yelled at, willing to get shoved. We've had our camera smashed, we've gotten punched in the face. When my little sister decided to do a CCBR internship, I was probably the least supportive person she knew. <laughs> and the first time I, I was actually outside of high school with her and I watched a fully grown teacher call her the C word, uh, I had to go and take a walk. But at the same time, that's what young people, ages 16, 17, 18, 19, are willing to deal with every single day on the streets because they also get to see girls go inside and get their cell phones out of their lockers so they can cancel the abortion they had scheduled for the following week. Awesome. But the real violence in this culture and in this country is not coming from us. It's coming from the other side. And all the things that the Attorney General said he was legislating against are things that we experience every single summer. And the reason you guys often don't hear about that is that at CCBR we recognize that we are not the victims. We are standing up for the victims. We don't want to distract from the plight of preborn children by making it all about us. But at the same time, we just recognize that when you have a successful social reform movement, you're going to get pushback. You know, Martin Luther King has a giant statue of himself right now, but in 1968 he got shot. He wasn't popular back then. Neither was Wilberforce, neither was Lewis Hine of the child labor movement. Abolitionists were regularly threatened with violence. We know that the real violence in our culture comes because when you live in a country that kills its preborn children, when you have that many people steeped in that much blood and that much guilt, this death culture spawns violence. But the good news is that there's an entire generation of young people on the front lines who are willing to put up with that level of violence to see the real invisible violence that nobody sees come to an end. I wish I, could, I wish I had time to share with you just even five, six, seven stories about what we've seen happen. We've seen people who protested us, who had signs with like coat hangers never going back, screaming at us over a three hour conversation, rip those signs in pieces and say, you know what? I can't believe how stupid my views were. Just a few months ago, we had somebody who uh, worked for International Planned Parenthood after a two hour conversation with us, looking at pictures of what the abortion victims looked like. She took her button off. She no longer felt comfortable wearing it because somebody had presented the truth to her, and it was somebody her age. Looking at CCBR's staff photo, actually, um, and I use this picture because we got a funny response. After we were delivering our postcards door to door, and door knocking door to door, and engaging people on their own front steps on the issue of abortion, we had a couple of abortion advocates go on Twitter, and they tweeted this picture out, and they said, we went to their website expecting to find a bunch of old people, but to add insult to injury, most of them are girls. 
<laughs> There's a great picture that I got from, from activism just the other day of one uh, an 18 year old female with a sign engaging somebody and right next is a white bearded dude with a sign that says this is what misogyny looks like. <laughs> I don't think he was giving the impression he intended to. <laughs> but it's flipped now because a lot of girls as well that we're finding, they actually realize that the number one group of people in this country who wants to keep abortion legal are men. Because it enables their behavior. It allows them to do what they want without consequences. And as a result, when I confront a young male on a university campus and said, do you think that every single woman in a crisis pregnancy, if she had the offer of immediate and total help, from the father of the child and people around her, how many abortions do you think would still happen? I think the number would drop over 50% overnight. One of the reasons people have so many abortions is because men push them towards it, and when you put young women out on the streets to have those conversations, the tone changes. Just to give you one idea before I take questions, I'm going to show you a short video clip of a few stories we got over the summer because we record each and every testimony that we take. Uh, we actually do polling before and after our projects. We found out that when people face the victims of abortion, 67% of people who come face to face with an abortion victim leave with a more negative opinion on abortion. But I wanna share with you just a few of those face to face conversations so that you can look at the people who are on the streets willing to put up with the violence to stop the violence of abortion. that we have hope for the pro-life movement going forward. First, history is on our side. This fight isn't 30 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old. It's 2,000 years old. And we've seen cultures of life spring out of cultures of death over and over and over again. Second of all, the arguments, the truth is on our side. Sometimes we forget how powerful truth is. When we show people what abortion victims look like, when we interact with the public, we see the truth in St. Augustine's words when he said, the truth is a lion. You don't need to defend it, just let it loose and it will defend itself. Third, the momentum is on our side. The battlefield is clear. 
The abortion rights movement in Canada barely exists, and they're desperately trying to hang on to the successes that they have with a group of people who are very tired because they fought the battles of legalization, but there's nobody there to take their place. It's up to us to show up and ensure that the work they did is undone during our generation. And then fourth, the youth are on our side. Again, that's intuitive, isn't it? When you have a culture of death, that's founding philosophy is the destruction of preborn children, there's not going to be a lot of people in the next generation to fight for that to go on. A suicidal philosophy like that can only last one or two generations, and it's up to ours to make sure that it actually gets rushed along just a little bit. There are many reasons for all of you to hope. Many of you have been working so hard for so many years, and I hope these few reasons give you a bit of encouragement as you go on. And remember what Martin Luther King Jr. said, he didn't get to see all the successes that his movement spawned, but he once said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice.